today on The Report, major developments of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Plus, gas price increases and why Americans won't be getting relief at the pump anytime soon. And hear what big move the Fullerton City Council made to help the homeless population. All this and more. The Report starts now. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Jessica Gonzalez. And I'm Marissa Flores. Follow us on Twitter at TheReportCSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new content. The world remains on edge, watching as Putin's vicious war on Ukraine rages. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Chris Adler, is here in studio to fill us in. You're right, Marissa. More than two million people have now fled Ukraine amid the Russian invasion, some seeking asylum in Poland and Romania, others crossing into Hungary and Slovakia. Now, Ukraine reports that at least 38 Ukrainian children have died because of this war, but that number may actually be far greater than what has been reported. Despite Russia's agreement to halt attacks for a 12-hour period to allow refugees to flee, the Russian military bombed a maternity and children's hospital in southern Ukraine yesterday, where Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reported that children were trapped under the wreckage. Reports claim that at least 17 people were injured as a result of the attacks, which Zelensky referred to as, quote, an atrocity. Zelensky has pleaded with the U.S. to close the skies by creating a no-fly zone, to which the U.S. government refused, saying a move like that could be seen by Putin as an act of war. The U.S. also refused Poland's offer to transfer its Russian-made MiG-29 fighter jets to a U.S. base in Germany to get those jets to the Ukrainians. The Pentagon says that flying combat aircraft from NATO territory into a war zone, quote, raises concerns for the entire NATO alliance and could put NATO directly into the war. President Biden also announced yesterday that the U.S. will ban Russian oil imports, which means Americans will be seeing even more price gas spikes at the pump. Some Americans saying it's a small price to pay for freedom. With more sanctions coming in against Russia, oil bans and major companies like Visa, MasterCard, McDonald's and Netflix pulling their services out of Russia, its economy is taking major hits. But the big question is whether or not this will be enough to stop Putin. It has been devastating and frustrating for many watching all of this unfold, wanting to do more, yet fearing that Putin will literally go nuclear. The U.S. seems to be treading lightly, while not only Ukrainian freedoms are at stake, but most importantly, Ukrainian lives. Back to you, ladies. Thank you for the report, Chris, and it's so great to have you back in studio with us. Well, I think we can all agree it's devastating what's continuing to go on in Ukraine. And I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say we send our condolences to the Ukrainian people. Um, I think the strength we've seen from the people so far, I don't know if you guys have seen any videos, but I've seen plenty on social media all over Instagram. People are literally, I don't even know what they are, if they're pipes, they're metal pieces and they're forming them together, putting them in the middle of streets to stop Russian soldiers. So just the strength of these people in Ukraine, I think, has been amazing just to see despite what's been going on. Um, now on our frontier, we see Biden, uh, whose campaign had a great deal to do with um, climate change and how we're going to combat it. He also, um, first thing when he came back into office, pulled us back into the Paris Agreement. Now, I personally believe climate change is a big thing that should be addressed by national leaders. Um, I think the more we decrease our fuel emissions, the better off we'll be, uh, especially for our future generations. Um, but when announcing the ban, Biden accurately, accurately said, quote, since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then, the price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going up further, end quote. He dubbed it Putin's price hike and blatantly said Russia is responsible. And I just think it's funny because I've seen so many people wanting Putin to do something about cutting off resources from Russia to, you know, show our opposition for the war. But now that he's done it, a lot of people are now complaining about the very guy, the gas prices from cutting off those oil emissions from Russia. Um, with that being said, my question for you ladies is, do you agree that Biden is once again making the patient and conscious, conscious decision by cutting off Russian oil, even if it means higher gas prices for us? 
I mean, I feel I, it's a great appreciation that Biden is doing something. Um, this is what people have wanted. We don't want to, we want to cut off all ties with Russia, and I understand that. It does it create a fear, though, that gas prices and prices of other things will continue to go up. And that's, I think, a common fear among everybody is like, well, how much more am I going to have to pay? That's the main question. So I, th I think everyone's kind of wondering like this, like this is a great effort, but will it be enough? Is this gonna like have any effect on Putin and his actions? Or is it just gonna continue to cost us more? That's my question, that's kind of what I'm asking. That's a good point, Jessica. Well, personally, as we mentioned last week, I do think these sanctions are the best way to go with things in terms of a possible war at this moment. And of course, both any kind of war, risk is involved, right? But it's, right now what we're facing with the gas prices is absolutely nothing compared to what the Ukrainians are facing. And interesting point is that's predicted that gas prices like on national wide level could, be, could go up to $4.50. And that is very significant. However, I think us as a country are going to need to adjust because things could get a lot worse from here on out. So I think it's something we need to consider, but, the same, but at the same time, I think we need to prioritize Ukrainian lives at the moment instead of gas prices. In light of the war, more and more Americans are questioning the vitality of supply constraints as President Biden cuts these ties with Russian oil imports. Energy corporations here in California have already reached a jaw-dropping average of gas prices to $5.44. The U.S. national average is rolling in at $4.17 per gallon for the unleaded gas. This means that with the current state of the U.S., gas prices have beat what once was the highest peak of $4.11 as of 2008's average. President Biden warns that, quote, Putin's war is already hurting Americans at the gas pump. With this action, it's going to go up further, end quote. Wow, as I mentioned, that is a big consequence, but hopefully gas prices will lower soon. I agree. Mexico soccer games, or football as it's called, are known for their excitement and passion, but last weekend fans went a little too far. A violent fight erupted between fans at a Mexico League soccer game between Atlas FC and Querétaro FC last, this past Saturday. The game was suspended after the fight pushed onto the field and led to the postponement of the games that were supposed to happen that Sunday. The intense rivalry sent 26 people to the hospital with at least one person in critical condition. Eyewitness accounts and claims of multiple deaths from the fight being covered up by the government have been circulating. Governor Mauricio Curry denies the claim, saying that he has nothing to do or nothing to gain from doing so. The Mexican League is currently investigating the incident, and so far, five officials, including police, civil defense, and preparation and planning employees, have been suspended. Locally, the homeless crisis is at an all-time high, and solving the issue is always at the forefront of political proposals but it seems as though officials don't quite know how to tackle the issue. Here in Fullerton, the City Council decided to extend their funding for the Illumination Foundation after a vote on March 1st. The Foundation is a nonprofit organization that aids the homeless community in the OC to gain stability through housing assistance, medical care, mental health services, etc. The vote passed with a 4-1 to majority, but faces opposition from homeless individuals themselves who believe the money is being misused by the foundation and should be put into resources like churches and bus passes that help facilitate their daily activities. All right, ladies. Now, when I was doing more research into this situation, I found there is a woman by the name of Eve Lucas, who is a resident of the center, who herself spoke to the Daily Titan and said the Illumination Foundation's management of the center has left it disorganized and unhygienic. Lucas herself also reported that she has to go weeks without a bed due to a bed bug outbreak that happened in the shelter as well. Um, so hearing this firsthand testimony, it seems like obviously all this money is going to the center and not much care seems to be given to these people living in the center who need the aid the most apparently. So my question to you is, do you wonder if the city should be paying more attention to these homeless individuals and hearing what they need rather than putting their money into one foundation and thinking the foundation will benefit from it? Well, I think, you know, especially a good thing you pointed out that quote from the individual because obviously they're not getting their basic, like, basic needs. So if they're not getting that, I think something obviously needs to be reconsidered. Maybe finding a new foundation, something different, because they're obviously not getting beds, they're probably not getting enough, maybe food or water, their, their basic, um, the basic things to live day, day to day. So if that's not happening, the bare minimum, I think something obviously needs to change. 
I think this also represents a bigger issue with politicians not listening to the people that they're supposed to represent. If homeless people are saying that we need certain resources, why not give the homeless people those resources? And I don't understand why there's such a disconnect. And it seems to me like it's a lack of empathy, right? Maybe something just to ensure that they look good on paper. Because that's the thing, we all want to be listened to, right? By, our, by the mayor, by city council members. So I think they need, really need to work on this issue and hopefully Fullerton opens up their hearts, their minds, and ensures that the homeless people are going to be able to get the care that they need. Tragic news struck Des Moines, Iowa after shots were fired around 2 p.m. at East High School on Monday, leaving one student dead and two injured. Police reports state that it was a drive-by shooting that left a 15-year-old boy dead who did not attend East High School but was the target. The two girls, ages 16 and 18, were transferred to a local hospital and are in critical condition. The six teenagers who led the shooting, ages 14 to 17 years old, were arrested and charged with murder. So this kind of indicates that there is a nationwide problem, especially when kids have access to guns and can use it as a means to take out their violence and aggression on others. And my problem is we hear this issue again and again and again every year, even every day. And it feels like nothing is really being done about it, right? We hear politicians maybe kind of hint that they might want to do something about it, maybe kind of put some kind of restriction or something or give mental health to these, uh, mental health care to these people. But it feels like we are always hearing this story and it makes me so incredibly depressed. There are victims here, literal kids. And so hopefully the government decides to do something about this and either restrict guns or ban them entirely, which I think would be safer for our society at large. What are your thoughts? I mean, I would agree with you. I think it's also alarming to hear that all six of the suspects were teenagers. I mean, what the highest age I I believe you said was 17 year olds, I'm sorry, but um, that's not much younger than us when you really think about it. And just the fact that these kids have access to weapons of that grade, but all six of them have access to those sort of weapons, I think I agree with you. That definitely shows we need reform in this country. But I would also go further in one step in agreeing with you that I haven't seen much get done. I would say that we do need these mental health services for these kids who, even have the thoughts that they need these weapons in the first place, what are we doing to care for them mentally? Like, why are these thoughts even going through their head to, I don't know, go through these actions and actually act out on this violence? It's just alarming that we're not doing anything. And like you said, we keep seeing things being said by these politicians, but nothing's being implemented. So can Americans do more to stop it? I don't know, but I would imagine our legislation can certainly do more about it. They can certainly have more programs for the youth in this country, and they can certainly pass legislation to guide us in the right direction. And I personally think that starts with addressing the stigma around mental health. Exactly, well said, Marissa. I agree. Um, it's sad to go in public and you hear like a loud noise and everyone's traumatized now because this happens so often. Um, to your guys' point, I don't think anything is being really changed yet, and I would love to see that. And I think that we can come up with a solution that makes both parties happy, in a way, with, like, times are different. Guns have changed. We need to have rules and laws that changed with these guns. And I think a lot of people are scared of us maybe completely taking guns away completely. For, no, you know, it, they get really dramatic, or more dramatic, but... I think we can find a way where guns are not just out on the streets or guns are not showing up in malls or schools or in the hands of wrong people, mentally ill people or people that just have bad intentions. So you mentioned uh, restrictions, you know, you don't want to necessarily take away guns in general, but what restrictions do you think we should put in place? Like, do you think there should be some kind of interview process or something? Because personally, I think we should just ban guns, get rid of the problem and maybe only give guns to certain authority. So like, what are your thoughts regarding that? I think with guns, I think there should be maybe an interview process, maybe some type of um, background check or a more extensive background check. Um, I think a lot of people have guns that there's no need for these, these like really um, intense guns. I don't, I don't think there's a really need for that. So with people like this and people that are just kind of going out to like a random store, because I think the gun law, you could be 18 years old to buy a gun. I think that should be changed too. I don't think you have to be this young. Um, so some type of ref reform I think should be happening. 
I would agree with you also, Jess, even like restricting some of these higher grade military weapons, yes. even having more legislation around those weapons, because there's no reason why those should be available to any 18 year old on the street, which like exactly. I said, aren't that younger than us. We were 18, what, probably two or three years ago. Yeah. So the fact that these kids can get a semi-automatic gun and carry out this kind of violence is really alarming. So I do agree. I don't think get rid of guns as a whole, but certainly do more to restrict what kind of guns we're putting out there and who they're going, whose hands they're ending up going in, I think can be restricted a lot more than what it is now. Yeah. Well, if you are a sports junkie, you might want to listen to this. Major League Baseball announced the cancellation of spring training games due to unresolved contract issues between its players and its owners. Major League Baseball had repetitive lockdowns due to COVID, which pushed back their training, but on Friday, their spring training was officially canceled. But after a month-long month lockdown, team players and owners negotiated a bargaining agreement, meaning there is a new tentative deal, which is subject to ratification by the union. Players are expected to report to spring training within the next few days, and if so, this is exciting news for baseball fans. And we are all excited for baseball to come back, I'm sure. I know I am. I, that's one thing, every year, right when the Super Bowl ends, I look forward to going, okay, Dodger Stadium, here we are, me and my family, we're in the, we're in the nosebleeds, I don't care, as long as we're there, we're, we're there and I'm happy. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And I think everyone always gets excited when spring training comes around, or at least I do. To be honest, like I don't watch a lot of baseball. However, I actually went to an Angels game in October, which was very fun. I'll be honest, I didn't really understand what was going on. <laughs> However, I loved the passion and the drive of the fans and how excited everyone was. So I just love it when someone just has a hobby and then they just pursue it completely and watch the shows, buy the merch, right? And so I think that's what I love about baseball fans. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just the fans hearing that they're going to be able to have that experience this spring, even after being scared that there might not even be a season at all. I agree with you guys that we're all super excited and I'm excited to have my Dodger dog and Dodger nachos <laughs> in the stands. So I'm looking forward to that. And with that, that's all the time we have today on the Report Roundtable discussion. Have a safe week, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Marissa Flores. I'm Amanda Mendoza. And I'm Jessica Gonzalez. As always, Titans, keep your tusks up and your heads held high. Until next time.